A little bit about somatic sex education is that it's descended from the work of uh, queerness um, and sex work. Um, there are many different ways of teaching somatic sex education, also called sexological body work. You probably, if you, if, well, I don't know if you probably, if you like goop, if you like Netflix and goop, then you might have uh, seen or heard of uh, the goop love and sex um, special or miniseries. I personally didn't see it myself yet. I know it's terrible that I didn't see it. I don't know if it's, it's good or bad, <laughs> the series itself, but uh, uh, that series centers sexological body work and somatic sex education. So that's the same profession, essentially. Um, we teach uh, the creation of an erotic temple, uh, where a sacred and safe enough space for erotic expression, permission to explore and pleasure positivity, uh, erotic ritual and sacred intimacy wrapped in um, practices like guided movement, breath work, masturbation, uh, consent, empowered choice and voice, counter normative ethics, um, new culture building, um, looking toward a world where there's racial and social justice, as well as body sovereignty, accessibility, and sex and kink positivity, while also being positive um, toward asexuality and the ace spectrum. Pleasure doesn't have to be sexual, and neither does the erotic, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and also the opportunity to experience touch in a safe and pleasurable way. That's what we do in, in this profession. Yeah. And so pleasure activism is a big part of, um, of our work. Um, and people, I think I've generally seen in my life, uh, seen two kinds of streams <laughs> of the use of this term, pleasure activism. One is uh, activism with pleasure, which I, I tend to see uh, more often actually in uh, racial justice spaces and um, movement spaces, particularly in uh, America, um, a sort of a notion that activism should, should be pleasurable. And, and that's not uh, limited to, to America by any means. I think the first time I encountered an idea like that was, um, I believe through the work of Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal, uh, uh, who are writers who were writers and teachers from uh, South America in a Latinx tradition, um, and uh, really who are encouraging that uh, activism for social change needs to be accessible to all people and also fun, <laughs> because it's more effective and sustainable that way. Um, and so when we think about activism um, with pleasure, we think about it as envisioning and creating a better and more pleasurable world, a world that is more fun and pleasurable to be in, um, as opposed to only uh, like a very serious like human rights, human is a right to food and water, and you know, which is true, we do, but um, also we might have a right to fun and enjoying our lives. And maybe that changes activism a little bit. Also centering pleasure as a principle of community building. So if we are building movement spaces, um, spaces of social change that um, uh, really welcome people and are accessible, then actually maybe pleasure is the key to that. And I don't know how many of you here have been involved in community organizing for social change. Maybe raise your hands. Yeah, yeah, so quite a few of you, me too. Um, I don't know about you, but I have spent a lot of time in meetings um, you know, hours and hours of meetings. Anyone else? Um, and then there's like not food and it's hot and sweaty and people are like, you have to be serious, you have the job done, agenda. And like, well, <laughs> and then there's usually a fight <laughs> of some kind, you know, um, and I'm like, oh gosh, like what if we really focused on uh, making this meeting more fun <laughs> and getting the agenda done? Uh, maybe we would stay in it longer <laughs> and, and burn out less. Um, so that's, another piece of uh, pleasure activism, and then using fun, creativity, and human connection as a strategy um, and tactic. And so this is like where we might see, I don't know, um, like a troop of amazing drag queens just clowning their way down the street in a protest, right? Or I don't know, I've seen protests where groups of people cover themselves in jam and like rolled all over a piece of paper. I don't really know what that was about, but it seems like it was fun for them. Uh, like, you know, in the streets um, when, as we do protest and change work using fun and creativity. Um, yeah, as a, as a way, and some, sometimes this is called tactical frivolity, which is just a jargony way of saying we can be silly while also we're being serious in the streets doing protest. Uh, so that's activism with pleasure. I think that's so important. How can we make the work of change fun? Um, 
because I think we get more people that way. <laughs> I think we get more people to do it that way. Um, and then there is activism for pleasure, which I hear about a little bit less, to be honest, but maybe that's just me. Um, which is the idea that pleasure itself is a uh, human right. So not pleasure as the tool towards social change, but pleasure as the object of social change, uh, the goal of social change. Um, and in this uh, activism for pleasure, um, we can see the traditions of sex positivity and body positivity. Um, so the idea that sex is good um, if we want it, you know, um, and that bodies are good and deserving of pleasure and affirmation, no matter what they look like, no matter how old they are. Um, sexual health and sexual liberation, so access to sexual health care um, of all kinds, up to and including contraception, abortion, all these kinds of things, and also sexual liberation, the ability to say no to sex that we don't want, um, and the ability to say yes to the sex that we do want, um, sex workers' rights and decriminalization, so understanding that pleasure work is in fact also a job um, that deserves to be paid and not criminalized, um, and harm reduction and destigmatization of substance use. Um, so this is the idea that when people do substances for fun or for pleasure, that that actually um, is also something that could be considered good and a human right, um, and that uh, risks to that are can be managed through harm reduction practices and destigmatizing uh, people who use substances. So that's sort of some streams or lineages of activism for pleasure, and activism with pleasure, and these things I think can be connected. Uh, if we center pleasure as a human right, then we're more likely to create movements for all kinds of other things racial justice, social justice, queer liberation, disability justice, we're more likely to create spaces that are accessible and comfortable if we believe pleasure is a human right. We are more likely to be welcoming and fun to be with as activists if we accept that all bodies are welcome and um, affirm all shapes and sizes and ages of bodies and abilities of bodies. We are more likely um, to build strong communities if we build in sexual liberation, the right to say no and the right to say yes. Um, and we're more likely to have strong movements if we weave in all different kinds of workers and all different ways of being. Yeah. I see that there's already some organizing going on in the chat, which is great. Excellent. We love organizing. Yes. And so here's a quote that often gets attributed to the anarchist Emma Goldman, but then also it's like, did she really say that? Or did someone else say it? I don't know. But supposedly this is a apocryphal story. Emma Goldman was a famous anarchist in the early 20th century. Um, and supposedly she was attending a very serious activist gathering. And at the time, lots of, most activism was dominated by men, you know, white anarchist men at that time in that place. Um, and supposedly uh, Emma Goldman was uh, dancing to some music and a very serious activist said to her, dancing is not becoming of an activist. Uh, and uh, supposedly she said, if I can't dance to it, then it's not my revolution. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, shots fired. 